A very warm welcome to everybody who has joined uh, this session today, uh, where we are going to be talking about emerging operational risk topics you need to have on your team's radar for 2024. Uh, I'm Manoj Kulbal, and I am co-founder and chief risk officer here at Risk Spotlight. Uh, for uh, I see some familiar faces of people who know me. They know that I'm, we are very passionate about risk management uh, as a strategic management tool for the organization. So not just for compliance and regulatory purposes, but actually use it as a business tool. Uh, I have been involved with operational risk management for nearly 19 years uh, and also been involved in various industry initiatives, uh, both with the ISO 31000 standard and also developing the certificate in operational risk management uh, with the Institute of Operational Risk. Uh, and I've included my contact details in case you need to get in touch with me uh, after this session. In this session, uh, we also have Jackie Cumberland uh, from DNB who will be joining us a bit later where she will be sharing ideas on how uh, uh, she uses and her team uses the Risk Spotlight portal content for monitoring external operational risk content. So people who don't know about Risk Spotlight portal, uh, this is a content service we provide. So let me just go to our website on the content page is where you'll be able to see the details of this particular offering. So today's session is about emerging risk and that's what Risk Spotlight Portal is about. It's about uh, providing access to external content around emerging operational risks, emerging regulatory updates, emerging best practices. So all the content you're gonna hear today is come from the research our team does. Uh, and then we have uh, various organizations who subscribe to this service so that they can keep monitoring these topics on a weekly or monthly basis. So that sort of is the basis of the content you're going to see today. So if any content you think is interesting and you want to do a little bit more research on that, then that's where you'll find that content in the Risk Spotlight portal. And I'll also show that to you a bit later of how you can use that content. But that's where Jackie will be coming and sharing a few ideas uh, on how her team uses and how it could be used by other organizations also. In terms of the scope of the topic, yeah, we've taken a big challenge. So we, we're trying to cover the content across all the major categories. Uh, and then uh, on the right hand side is where you have the different risk themes we are going to touch. And of course, you, you've been involved with operational risk, then you know that, yeah, the scope is so huge that it becomes very difficult to try and condense everything. But at least in the time we have, we've tried to bring some of the important points. So at least those points yeah, should be on your radar. But in reality, yeah, there is there is a lot of detail under each of these topics because each of these risk categories you know, can be like a specialist area on its own right. And then of course we have all the content in the portal if you wanna dive into the details of any topic today. In terms of uh, the emerging operational risk topic, so we focused on the two aspects. So we focused on uh, bringing out uh, what operational risks are new or unique. Uh, so, so this is where these risks may not be on your risk register, on the risk profile of your organization last year, but you may have to add them this year because now there is increasing evidence that uh, your organization needs to consider those risks. So we'll talk about some of those risks, mm -hmm. uh, but they are very few. So there's not that many new risks emerging all the time. Uh, so the biggest chunk of the content is going to be the second category where you we have these risks on your risk register, but now the likelihood or the potential impact of that risk is changing. So in terms of the going into the details. So let's start with the new topic where the biggest topic I think for uh, 2024 is going to be the AI related risk. So let's drill down a little bit more into that. And the new element here is generative AI. So while we've been talking about AI for the last 10 to 15 years, there are various organizations we've, which have already implemented AI applications for credit card fraud detection, cyber risk, money laundering. Those are all applications which I classify for today's discussion as narrow AI. So these are AI applications which are built on training a large amount of data. You need a lot of experts to build those AI models. Uh, and then they are built for a specific use case. So you cannot use the credit card fraud detection uh, AI model you know, to also use for cyber risk. You'll have to like build a new model for that. And because of the increasing cost of those AI models, only large firms could afford those AI technologies. 
But what is new on the radar is generative AI. So, so this came into sort of public knowledge in November 2022 when OpenAI launched ChatGPT and 100 million users signed up in the first two months uh, for ChatGPT, which made it the fastest adopted technology ever created by humans. So it was faster than mobile phone, faster than social media, faster than internet. And then it has significant implications on operational risk management. Uh, but these generative AI tools, they can be used for lots of different use cases. So you don't need to build like a different model for different use cases. So, so that sort of is where they differentiate from the narrow AI uh, technologies we've all been used to. So, so this is where in your organization, now you can't just say AI risk. You'll have to be very specific because if you talk about just AI risk, then you're talking about the risk of these narrow AI applications. But when you want to talk about the generative AI risks, you'll need to be very specific because the risks of generative AI are very different to the risks of the traditional AI applications uh, we have been used to. So this is where there is some new language, some new risks, controls we need to think about. So, so you need to start qualifying when people are talking about AI risk in your organization. Are they talking about the narrow AI risk, uh, like using for credit card fraud detection cyber risk, or are they talking about generative AI? So this, uh, so we saw that, yeah, this technology was introduced in November 2022, so it's not been in the market or in the industry for that long. But because there are significant benefits of using this technology, there are various financial services firms which have already taken the lead. Uh, and, and most of the use case right now is in the innovation areas where organizations are creating products and services using AI where those products and services can make uh, revenue. Uh, so like you can see the Morgan Stanley where they built a wealth management chatbot which can provide advice to customers. So they've trained the generative AI model on all the knowledge uh, a wealth management chatbot needs to know. Uh, so customers can then ask, uh, get advice in terms of you know, what investment they should make, what should be their portfolio like from a chatbot. But then you also have a use case with Goldman Sachs where their IT team is using ChatGPT to develop code because ChatGPT can also write code for a specific application. Uh, and then we see that organizations are increasingly also using that functionality to build their internal IT applications. So while generally most organizations right now, the stance is that, okay, we don't allow ChatGPT in our organization, they, they, that doesn't mean that nobody in organization is using ChatGPT because the opportunity uh, is too huge that an organization will say 100% no, a no to chat GPT. So most organizations are exploring, piloting, and then some of the leading organizations have already taken the lead in terms of uh, at least the value creation part. And we hope that in the next 12 to 18 months, it can also be used for operational risk management, the value protection activities. But the focus right now is more on value creation and slowly transitioning to the value protection activities. So when we look at the risks, so these are all new risks because generative AI as a technology itself is new. So, so it introduces a lot of new risks. So I, I wanna cover the risks of organization utilizing generative AI, risks of organization not utilizing generative AI, and then whether your organization decides to use generative AI or not, the cyber criminals and the fraudsters are already uh, starting to use generative AI. So you're already exposed to the risk, uh, mainly in the external fraud and cyber categories from these generative AI technologies. So I wanna drill down into these three categories a little bit. So first, if we uh, look at the risks of organizations utilizing generative AI, then the biggest concern has been employee share sensitive information in the chat GPT window. Uh, and that sort of is where organizations you know, had, have booked a blanket halt at the moment because they did not understand the risk. So they didn't, didn't want employees to go and enter sensitive information into the chat window. But this risk is mitigated to a large extent. So now there are lots of effective mitigation ways where this risk is not that relevant, but it was yeah, a very high risk uh, six to nine months ago when the technology was very new and a lot of organizations did not know how do we protect our data. Uh, but now the various uh, vendors of the generative AI tools have created mitigations around this particular risk, but it's still something to be aware of. 
The other big risk uh, of using generative AI is that it may uh, it may give you information which may not be correct. And, and that's where if you go and make some important business decisions. So, so that sort of is where that you can have controls that, of course, you don't fully rely on AI in 100 percent that you, a human will always need to check and intervene and validate any data which is provided by AI. So while it is a big risk, I think there are lots of effective ways of mitigating this particular risk also. Then uh, we've seen the regulator in the US uh, uh, from SEC uh, have created this concept. So like in e ESG, there is this concept of greenwashing. Now you'll start hearing this term called AI washing. So this is where a lot of organizations are starting to claim that their products and services are better because they are using AI. And when you look at the reality, it may not be using that much AI in the background. So, so you'll start hearing about yeah, this concept a little bit more. Uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months around AI washing. So it's another new risk to have on the radar. Generative AI can generate a lot of text. It can generate images. It can generate video. So there is also uh, currently uh, ambiguity on who owns the intellectual property. So if you create an image of somebody, uh, then you know does your organization own the royalty of that image or does the AI company, which the model you use own the IP. And this is where different court cases are happening in different countries. Uh, and we'll see over yeah, the next 12 to 18 months, depending on how these court cases resolve, what the state of the ownership of intellectual property is going to be. But this is only relevant yeah, if you use AI to generate something where you want to own the intellectual property. But if you want to yeah, just use it for risk management purposes, increase productivity in the organization, then it's not such a relevant risk. Another area organizations, the regulators are starting to get concerned is unethical use of AI. So, so this will then go into the conduct risk aspect uh, of the risk register, where if AI can be used for manipulating markets, for example, so that's something regulators have expressed recently, that organizations you know, could use AI to manipulate markets because they can now do a lot of things at very quick speed. So, so this is gonna be another area of concern you, you're gonna hear in the coming weeks and months. We saw the example of Goldman Sachs using uh, AI uh, to generate code. And this is where AI is generating the code. Then there is always the likelihood that that code may not be 100% correct. So, so and additional risk we need to consider is yeah have extra level of testing and quality check on any code which is written by AI and then before you put that into production or uh, give it integrated into an application which may impact the customer experience. Disruption to processes utilizing Gen AI due to the outage. So if you are using ChatGPT, then we've seen a couple of outages recently uh, with OpenAI, where then your team may not be able to use ChatGPT for those few minutes or few hours. Uh, there is the disruption. Uh, so this is you know another risk. So like if you rely on Microsoft Azure or Amazon AWS and they face an outage, then whatever processes depend on those services, then they get disrupted. So a similar risk comes in here. So depending on which vendor you are using, if that vendor experiences an outage and they are hosting the AI model, then it may affect uh, the processes which are using those tools. And there's also at the moment, yeah, concern on AI model vendor misusing data, which is shared by the users and at least all the leading uh, model vendors like OpenAI of ChatGPT, you know, they've come and provided a lot of assurance, a lot of controls around this to make sure that your yeah, organizations are not concerned about this uh, specific risk. And there's of course, yeah, the likelihood that the AI model vendor may suffer a data breach and then if you have details of your users and your queries that that data may get compromised, but that's a, again, a, a risk, you know, which is always there. If the data is sitting outside your organization, then that risk is always there. But in this context, yeah, it's specific uh, if the AI model vendor suffers a data breach. So these are all sort of yeah, the risk topics, which if your organization starts using generative AI, but if your organization says, okay, we're not using generative AI, then you don't need to worry about these risks. 
And then uh, because generative AI can be used to also identify risks, identify controls, do control testing, control assessments, risk assessments. So organizations who start using generative AI and they allow their first line users to start using ChatGPT to identify risk, develop their control libraries, then this is one of the risks the second line team needs to worry about that you may suddenly see that the quality of the risk documentation, the control documentation increases significantly. But in reality, you know, those controls are not really implemented, not really mitigated. So traditionally, we have the issue where the, qual the documentation quality was not very good and the implementation may not be good. But now, at least with generative AI, the documentation can improve significantly because ChatGPT can write much better quality of control documentation than a typical first line person can. So you should at least see improve in documentation quality, but that should not direct uh, that should not mean that oh the actual implementation of those same control is also effective. Uh, so second line team yeah will need to increase their oversight that uh, they they need to make sure that yeah, you are actually checking whether those controls are actually implemented and they are effective. And then the technologies are yeah, moving so far. So at the moment, yeah, six months in generative AI is like three years in the real world. So uh, the pace is really quick and it has completely caught the governments and the regulators by surprise. So there is not that much regulation. So only now uh, in the last three uh, uh, to four months is where regulators are starting to catch up. So uh, EU, uh, in the US, uh, in the UK, regulators are now starting to catch up. So there'll be a lot more regulations coming out in the in the coming months where we will become aware of okay, what are the new regulatory risks around complying with these regulations. But we will see some very fast regulation coming in. So if your organization is using generative AI, then trying to keep match with those regulatory changes is also going to be an important topic. Then if your organization decides not to use generative AI, so you say that, okay, we, we don't want to use generative AI, then the risks you need to be aware of is that employees and specific teams, they may start creating shadow IT AI systems in the organization. Uh, and, and that sort of, yeah, is always the risk that when you ban, but because the benefits that something which takes two days, if it can be done in two hours, then people are going to try to use that technology, uh, whether, you know, the organization supports them or organization doesn't, doesn't support them. So you will start to see that if you don't have a consistent strategy and messaging, you, you will start seeing shadow AI systems pop across the organization and then in 12 to 18 months time, it may be very difficult for you to try and control that. Uh, so that sort of is one risk to be aware of if the, your organization is, yeah, is adopting this stance of, no, we're not gonna use generative AI. And then there are the strategic risks. Uh, so we also have participants from the non-financial risk team where you look at operational risk, but you also look at the strategic or the business risk. So if the, your organization decides not to use generative AI, then, you're also exposed to the strategic risks that you will then, if your competitors are using it, you will start to see uh, that you will be at a disadvantage from a productivity perspective against your competitors. So your cost and your profits, you will be at a disadvantage if your competitors start using generative AI and they're able to do things a lot more efficiently at lower cost and higher profit then in three to five years time, you know, it, it will become significant, that particular gap. And also around the innovation that a lot of organizations are now also using generative AI to create new products and services to get that competitive advantage. So that's another strategic risk your organization will need to be aware of if it says, oh, we don't want to use this technology uh, for the next 12 months or the next two years. And then, like I said earlier, whether yeah, you like it or not, uh, the act, the malicious actors are starting to use generative AI. So, so they're already starting to use generative AI for improving the quality of phishing emails. Uh, we're going to talk about deep fake in a little bit more detail, but this you'll you'll hear this word a lot, where they can create um, misleading information and to commit fraud or uh, to spread misinformation about your organization. I'll drill down on the next slide on that. And then also the sophistication of external frauds is going to increase uh, significantly. It's already increasing significantly. So you need to make sure that your external fraud controls 
now are aligned with the increased sophistication of these technologies fraudsters are using. And cyber criminals are also starting to use generative AI to launch you know, a lot more sophisticated cyber attacks. So again, your cyber controls then need to be upgraded to make sure they're aligned with the improved capabilities of generative AI. We, I talked about deep fakes, so this is going to be a big thing. You're going to hear a lot more about deep fakes uh, in 2024, and we've already seen a 31 times increase in the amount of deep fakes uh, which have been generated. And this is because a lot of these generative AI tools now, it's very cheap and very quick to create deep fake images or videos uh, of real people. And it's possible to do that in very high volume. And a big driver this year is going to be that there are 40 countries around the world which are going into an election cycle. And these represent 41% of the world's population. So India, Indonesia, UK, US, and they represent 42% of the world's GDP. So, so this is where deepfakes is going to be used extensively in that political cycle. And because Donald Trump is yeah, back in the game in the US presidential election, you know, there's going to be a lot more, you know, he has his own way of escalating these type of trends. So, so we are going to, you know, see a lot more in the political realm use of uh, deep fakes. And it'll become very, very difficult to trust information on the internet and social media in 2024. Some of you may say it's already, uh, it's already very difficult to trust information on the internet, but it's only going to multiply significantly more uh, in 2024. And then from an uh, operational risk perspective, yeah, we'll see deep fakes in an external fraud uh, related schemes. Uh, and this is where uh, somebody can also then create a campaign of one of your senior executives doing something, you know, that they have not done or saying something they have not done. So, so there's also that reputational impact of, you know, somebody creating a video of one of your senior executive saying or doing something they have not done. So that's another way in which you may see deep fake uh, materialize in the organization. Then another big trend we're starting to see now is transition to AI operated organization. So, so we're starting to see that firms will increasingly adopt generative AI and traditional AI tools to replace as many processes as possible over a three to 10 year. So this is not all going to happen in 2024. It's a cycle. It's a three to 10 year cycle. And it started and it will get fast track when we achieve artificial general intelligence. So this is the stage everybody is waiting for where OpenAI, the mission of OpenAI is to create artificial intelligence uh, where we achieve AGI, which means that AI will have the capability to make decisions like humans. So it's not there yet. So right now the technology, the generative AI technology we have, it's probably better than 50% of the operational risk experts you have in your organization. So if you count the number of people who call themselves as operational risk expert, today probably generative AI is better than 50% of those experts in your organization. Once we achieve artificial general intelligence, it'll be in the 90s percent. So it'll be 95% that the AI technology will be better than 95% of the experts in your organization. And we've seen because of yeah, the coming recession, a lot of organizations have started making headcount uh, head count cuts. And it is possible that yeah, those jobs may not come back because organizations may replace those roles with automated AI type tools. But again, remember, yeah, it's not in 2024. So this is, we're talking about a three to 10 year uh, time frame. And one of the common sort of mantra which is being used is this, yeah, humans who don't use AI will be gradually replaced by humans who do. So initially, yeah, uh, initially this is gonna happen. AI is not going to just replace humans because we'll always need humans to be involved, to check the data, to make the decisions. Uh, and then the same applies for risk management, that from a risk management perspective, Prompt engineering is the new must have skill. So like you need to know how to use Excel, you need to know how to send email, how to surf the internet. Prompt engineering is gonna become that skill uh, where the skill is about how do you talk to the generative AI models and get output from the generative AI models for your day-to-day -day task. So in this case, yeah, AI is initially replacing mundane tasks, but slowly it'll also start replacing the higher value activities in your organization. So as risk management practitioners, you need to be aware of the transition. 
uh, because you'll start to see risks in the employment relationship area, business disruption area, business process failures, supply chain, and external fraud. Then that's where during this transition, the risk profile around all of those risk categories is going to change significantly. And this presents yeah, a significant opportunity for risk and compliance professional because the regulatory landscape is going to change very quickly in the next 12 to 24 months. So we need our compliance professionals to help organization understand those regulations. And then for the risk professionals, it's also a great opportunity that it, it gives us an uh, opportunity to help our organization go through this transformation where the risk landscape is going to change so significantly. And of course, there is yeah, a wider societal risk uh, in this transition. So it's not just your organization transitioning, but the societies and countries and the world is also going through this transition. But that's yeah, where the politicians are talking about that uh, and other organizations are talking about that. There's not a, lot, not a lot you can do at an organization level, but there are a lot of discussions happening of yeah, how do we prepare the society in a country to go through that transition over this three to 10 year period. And because this is going to be a big topic for the, the next two to three years, you know, we, we are investing a lot in this space. So we want to invite them yeah, for practitioners who are interested in exploring these risks and exploring the mitigation strategies and what controls you have in place. We are organizing a AI operational risk forum on the 29th February. So it'll be a two hour session, but it will not just be me presenting. It'll be a discussion where we will make sure that yeah, operational risk practitioners talk to each other. And then, of course, we'll bring our expertise and insight wherever possible. But it'll be a discussion. It won't be recorded. It'll be under Chatham House rule. Uh, but we want to start facilitating that conversation with the operational risk experts who work in uh, financial services industry so that you know we can start looking at this in a more constructive way rather than just looking at as a threat because I think the opportunities outweigh the amount of risk exposure around this technology but yeah we just need to be smarter in how we respond uh, to this new transformative technology so if this is yeah something of interest that you if you are responsible in your organization to understand and explore these generative AI risks then uh, this may be a forum and the details are on our website. Uh, we also yeah, uh, have a prompt engineering course. So I, I, I don't have time to go into the details of this, but if you want to start learning about this technology so you can start understanding the benefits of this technology, you can start understanding the risks of this technology, then the best way is to learn this technology. So that's why we have created a 15 hour course where we can teach your second line team everything about this technology, but also how to use this in operational risk management context. So if this is something of interest, then yeah, contact me and we can give you a little bit more details. Then let me move to the second category around blockchain and crypto assets. So this is where we've seen significant changes happen in 2023. So uh, if for uh, organizations uh, or individuals who are following this on 10th January, SEC approved various ETFs. So these are all the different ETFs which are approved. And, and this was a big move because this then allows pension funds, sovereign funds, various organizations to, to now start investing, at least in Bitcoin. So all of these ETFs are related to Bitcoin, but this is where now the crypto sort of industry and the financial services industry are starting to merge together that so far they were like two different industries, but we'll see in 2024 and beyond, they will start merging together. So at least in these organizations like Fidelity, BlackRock, you know, there are products being offered around blockchain and crypto assets. So of course, the second line team now need to understand the third line team, internal audit team, they need to start understanding these technologies if you want to provide your oversight and assurance related responsibilities. Then the BlackRock CEO also has recently said that uh, you'll start hearing more around tokenization, that these ETFs were basically the move around tokenization, where we will have uh, real life assets, which will then broken uh, get broken down into small segments. So to, today, if you want to buy a house, you have to buy the whole house, or if you buy a mortgage, then the bank owns the part of that house. But with tokenization, Lots of people will be able to buy, you know, smaller shares in your house and then they can trade those shares on a market so you don't have to sell the house to benefit from uh, uh, the, the price appreciation of that house. Basically, you'll be able to create shares 
in a house and then different people can own different shares of that house. But house is just one example. So, so we're going to see a big wave around tokenization where many real life assets will get tokenized. And Europe also is making big waves on this. So, so there is the market in crypto asset regulation, uh, which is then creating that regulatory environment around making crypto uh, assets safe uh, within the EU. And we'll see on the next slide that many countries at the moment are going through that regulatory cycle uh, where some sort of regulation will be in place. So, so organizations and individuals will be able to buy and sell and own uh, these particular assets. The uh, Financial Accounting and Standard Board also recently announced a change in the accounting rules, which now then makes it easy for organizations to hold crypto assets on the balance sheet. So if they want to invest, then the rules, the accounting rules were not very favorable. But with the recent change, uh, it, it just creates more incentive for more organizations to also invest some of their treasury into uh, Bitcoin assets. So that will, you know, could become another driver. And of course, we've seen huge inflation over the last 12 to 18 months. So in some of the countries like Turkey, Argentina, where the problem has been significant, we've seen a large majority of citizens you know, uh, move their assets to uh, crypto related assets to protect themselves against you know, those multiple hundred uh, times uh, inflation. So there is a lot happening in this space where the operational risk teams need to be aware of. And, and this introduces then all the risks around using new technologies that we need to invest in learning this technology, because if we don't know, then how are we going to challenge our first line team when they start launching new products and services around this technology? And this integration is only going to increase. So today, crypto and traditional financial market was different, but now they, they're going to start merging uh, you know, more and more in 2024 and beyond. And, and there are very different uh, contexts, there, there are very different technology around this risk, so especially around the decentralized nature. So there are a lot more systemic risk around this technology because this is not something you install and implement in your organization. It's a public technology and everybody is using it. So if your organization starts offering Bitcoin or Ethereum type products and offerings, it's not your offering, right? So there is a whole market. So, so we're going to have a lot more systemic risks we need to be aware of if we start using uh, these technologies. Many central banks are also looking at central bank digital currencies. So as yeah, those rollout happens, there is big changes uh, uh, which could happen to the uh, privacy and financial crime related risks as those rollouts happen. Uh, but it may be you know, sort of yeah, two to five years of when they happen, but at least their progress, the pilots are happening in different jurisdiction. The digital identities you'll see on blockchain will become crucial. So we saw the deep fake that it will become very difficult to trust information on internet. And this is where blockchain is going to provide that solution where you're going to have a digital identity. And because on blockchain, it's not in control of any one organization, you can have much stronger identity because those identities cannot be changed that once it's created, it's frozen, that it's very difficult then for somebody to create a fake information if it's not associated with that identity. So we'll see that for the deep fake risk, the solutions are gonna come from blockchain-based uh, technologies. And we talked about yeah, the regulatory updates already and the second line and third line teams, yeah, you just need to start learning uh, this technology so you're able to do your oversight and assurance related roles. And many organizations that we've already seen with Fidelity, BlackRock, they've started educating their customers because for the customers also buying and owning crypto asset is a new thing. Uh, so your organization will also need to spend time on educating the customer like we do with other fraud related risks so that customers get more comfortable in owning these assets and your organization is able to sell more of the products and services around this. Then let me switch to our third topic, which is operational resilience. So in operational resilience, so this is a broad topic. And of course, there are various drivers which are affecting the level of operational resilience and the level of preparedness of your organization. So we have geopolitical risk, cyber risk, AI risk, third party, outsourcing, 
various organizations are going through technology upgrades in a way you may be moving to a cloud-based environment or just moving to modern applications. So, so that sort of, yeah, bring its own risk, which could affect the resilience. And then uh, 70, 80% of the organizations are already using cloud. So, you know, that has its own set of risks. There is the insider risk and the climate risk. So there is a lot happening from an operational resilience perspective, from a macro driver perspective. From a regulatory perspective, so at least for the European organizations, uh, it's uh, to 2024 is going to be a lot about yeah, preparing for uh, compliance with DORA, uh, which is the resilience regulation. Even in UK, firms are preparing to demonstrate that they can remain within the defined impact tolerances. So that's coming due. So for the UK organizations also, that's going to be a big priority uh, in 2024. And we're starting to see that a lot of these operational resilience regulations are now starting to extend uh, into the third parties. So it's not just about the resilience of your organization, but you also will need to extend that to your third party. So, and the, the regulations are gonna sort of force that move uh, that also third parties come into the jurisdictions. And we've seen yeah, one case, at least that the regulators are serious uh, where uh, the CIO of TSP Bank was fined in April 2023 for the major uh, IT system failure which happened, which started this whole operational resilience regulatory discussion uh, in UK. There are personal implications and personal consequences if something major goes wrong around operational resilience incidents. Then let me talk about some of the topics uh, around cyber risk. So. One interesting thing we've seen in cyber risk is that cyber criminals are reporting or threatening to report ransomware or data breach to regulators. So this is where cyber criminals are going and directly reporting that they have launched a ransomware attack against an organization. And now most jurisdictions have a regulation that they need to report these incidents within 48 hours or four business days. And if they don't do that, then cyber criminals are going to report the organization to the regulators. And we've already had one case in 2023 where that happened, where a cyber criminal gang hacked a organization, the organization didn't report it, and the cyber criminals then reported it directly to SEC. And that's how SEC found out. And that became an extortion technique, because otherwise the organization can then just hide that information. But cyber criminals are now make, taking advantage of this regulation if organizations don't respond in a timely manner, then the criminals are reporting a cyber attack directly to the regulators. There is also a lot of debate uh, ongoing in terms of yeah, whether paying ransomware payments should be legal, illegal, you know, related to sanctions and so on. Uh, so there is no end. So at least in UK, the government has said that uh, uh, there won't be any ban on paying ransomware at least for two years. So that it'll be revisited. But there are various countries and jurisdictions which are thinking whether paying uh, for ransomware payments, should it be made illegal or you know should it be allowed in some cases? So we'll see that debate will continue in 2024. We've already yeah, talked about the AI, that uh, the, the sophistication of cyber attacks, especially the DDoS, the data breach and ransomware, that those three areas of cyber risk, you know, the scale and the impact of those risks is going to increase significantly because cyber criminals are now using these new AI technologies and organizations are slow in terms of using those AI technologies. So there was just a big mismatch between the speed in how quickly organizations are adopting AI and how quickly these cyber criminal gangs are utilizing AI. Another uh, trend we've seen is in API. So API is the application programming interface, which is used to integrate like two applications with each other to exchange data. And uh, because a lot of applications now use API, so especially when uh, you have a lot of cloud-based applications, cyber criminals have realized this, and now they are going after those APIs. They're trying to find which APIs are not secured, uh, your organization is maybe not be aware, and they, they're starting to use that to get access to the systems and data. Another trend we have seen is cyber criminals are looking for security vulnerabilities, especially on the cloud, that if you had an ex-employee who did some setting, they were doing some customer analysis, they moved a lot of customer data on a cloud, uh, and then they left and they did not hand over that particular cloud environment to 
uh, somebody else in the team. So that cloud environment remains there. And that's where we've seen a trend on a set of news articles where cyber criminals are increasingly looking for those type of cloud environments which have been left by ex-employees because then it's much easier for them uh, that it's not on the monitoring radar. So it, it's easier for them to get access to any data those ex-employees had on uh, those particular platforms. And we see in, in December 2023, so most US public companies are now subject to the SEC new rules on cybersecurity. So this is around your reporting that you have four days to report cyber incidents and uh, the board members need to be aware and trained. So there's also uh, aspects of that introduced in the regulation where organizations have to demonstrate that their board members understand cyber risk. They are technology savvy. And one of the key constraints which has remained uh, is the cyber risk expertise, that they're just not enough cyber experts, which then just makes it difficult, especially for the small and medium-sized financial services organization to get access to good quality cyber experts to manage these particular risks. But that is a that is a global constraint which has been there for the last two or three years and it'll probably continue in 2024. And one of the big sort of the black swan or the unknown type event is quantum computing around the cyber risk. So there have been some progress in quantum computing. So I think in the world, there's probably four or five quantum computers at the moment. Uh, but as yet, this technology evolves quickly, then all the security, the online banking security, the mobile banking security methodologies we have, they will all become invalidated. So we'll have to rethink security on the internet as quantum computing you know, becomes more widely adopted, but it's probably a three to four year journey, but something people who are keeping an eye on emerging risk, they need to have that on their radar and keep monitoring the progress in that space. Then uh, the next sort of uh, topic we can touch is ESG, and then I'll, I'll uh, include climate risk. So we can combine those two because there's a good amount of overlap between those two topics. So. 2023 also set a record like 2022 did, where it was, again, the warmest year. Uh, the average losses were above average. So we lost yeah, 380 billion due to natural disaster uh, in 2023. Uh, and, and there was also a new record where there were 37 natural disaster event uh, where each event was a billion dollar or more. So that was a new record which was set globally. And it was also a record that it was the deadliest year since 2010, where 16,500 people died because of heat-related deaths. So that's just yeah, how 2023 was. Uh, and in the global risk report, which was issued by the World Economic Forum, this is one of those black swan, big, uh, low likelihood, high severity type event where they highlighted deliberate climate manipulation technologies, you know, could be used by certain countries. Uh, and, and particularly it will be used where whichever country starts having water shortage first. So we're starting to see that many countries faced water shortage because of the heat waves last year. And at some point, some country is going to yeah, reach a limit where they will try to deliberately manipulate the climate to generate artificial rain or something like that. And then, because those technologies don't respect the boundary, it won't just be that country, it could go and affect many other countries. So there is a, a little bit more detail in the global risk report around that uh, particular risk. Then in 2023, we started to see a back, backlash against ESG. And, and this was particularly around the Republicans that a lot of Republican politicians in the US went sort of anti-ESG. Uh, and, and right now, as of 1st Jan 2024, there are 20 states in the U.S. which have enacted anti-ESG investing rules. So they actually will penalize an organization if they, uh, uh, if they don't invest in oil and gas company or coal-related company. So they've adopted an anti-ESG investing rule. And only eight states have pro-ESG investing rule where if, they, if the state government has a pension fund, then they cannot invest in coal or oil and gas uh, type companies. So we, we're starting to see that trend, uh, at least in the US, not so much in the Europe, but at least in the US where uh, things are going against anti-ESG. And Larry Fink from BlackRock, you know, has also said that he's stopped using this term because it's getting very politicized. Uh, and we've seen example of McDonald's, for example, on their website, they removed the word ESG because they saw that, okay, that was that word 
is because it's getting so much politicized, they have just stopped using that word completely in their on their website and in their uh, public communication. And if we have a Republic president who wins in the November election, then at least in US, we'll start to see big sort of anti-ESG type movement, which will then reverse all the progress which have been made uh, over the last uh, three to five years in that space, but not so much yet in Europe, at least. Uh, greenwashing is where yeah, we've seen there is yeah, increased regulation. So in Europe, in US, uh, even in yeah, parts of Asia, uh, governments have adopted. So we've seen in Australia also government has adopted new regulatory regulations around greenwashing. Uh, and in some US states, they are also expanding that and just making that as part of normal consumer protection uh, uh, clauses. Uh, they're introducing greenwashing as part of that. So so those yeah, regulations are going to continue and we'll need to comply. But a new way we saw in 2023 was green hushing. So this is where, because now there is so much enforcement on, on greenwashing, and if, a, if an organization is saying that, okay, we are this climate friendly and this is our data, then a lot of external stakeholders are now evaluating that data from a very critical perspective. So many organizations have taken a step back that now they are intentionally not publishing all the ESG data in their public communication. And that sort of movement is called green hushing. So they're just saying enough but not everything. While three years ago, everybody wanted to say how great they were from an ESG perspective, but not so much right now. And we are seeing that definitely in Sweden and France, they were on the top of the list of that trend where organizations have pulled back the amount of communication they're sharing with the outside world uh, on their ESG related initiative. So there was a big uptake in that in 2023. And with all the greenwashing regulation, I'm assuming that yeah, that will continue to be the case in 2024 also. And there is yeah, increasing demand for large firms to analyze climate risks. So we've seen yeah, various regulators, at least for the large organizations, they're making sure that yeah, these large organizations analyze their climate risk with operational credit market and share those findings uh, with the market. From an Operational risk perspective, this yeah, comes out as business uh, disruptions. We'll, we'll see uh, due to large scale climate change protests and the increase in frequency and severity of natural disasters. Increased regulation on reporting ESG data. And we'll see that also it'll get extended to the third party. So you'll also have to make sure your third parties are reporting on the ESG data, not just your organization. So, there is regulation coming to enforce that particular aspect of the reporting. And we're starting to see an increased number of legal cases because there are these so many climate protest NGOs. They just want to file a case against a company who they think is not protecting the climate and they don't care about the consequences. They just want to create trouble. So there has been a significant increase in the number of cases. So even though they know they will not win, they just want to create that disturbance, uh, that reputational impact uh, in the press against an organization. Uh, and then, of, of course, as an organization, there's a reputational impact. You have to pay the legal fees to fight those cases. So, so that has increased in 2023. So I'm assuming that yeah, that'll also stay like that in 2024. And in the, uh, the World Economic Report, the Global uh, Risk Report for 2024, there was also this mention of Arctic opening because the the at the arctic the ice is melting so now there are uh, pathways getting created for ships to go uh, and send products uh, uh, across those uh, shipping channels so there are new shipping channels opening but because of that ice melting yeah, there, there could be opportunities uh, for companies to transport products uh, that it may be quicker to transport via uh, those arctic shipping channels but then it also introduces many risks of that ice melting, especially for the Scandinavian countries and Canada, US, uh, which are around uh, those Arctic ice melting areas. But that sort of yeah is also one of those big uh, type risks, not so much specific to an organization, but at least uh, at the country level, something to keep an eye on. Then uh, I'll do the geopolitical risk and then uh, we will switch to Jackie and then uh, get her input on how her team is using the content to analyze yeah, this type of content. 
Uh, so from a geopolitical risk perspective, so for people who are interested, there's a very good book uh, called The Changing World Order, where the author Ray Dalio has done an analysis of how sort of different empires get created. And then if an empire is on the down and a new empire emerges, that that's where a lot of geopolitical tension happens. So this author has analyzed a lot of history. So you can see where at one stage, Netherlands, you know, was like the dominant power and then UK was the dominant power. And at the moment, US is the dominant power, but the decline has started uh, where, you know, no country can be a dominant power forever, right? So, so there's always this shift which happens in the history. And you can see sort of, yeah, China is quickly going to take over that position uh, in, in terms of becoming the dominant power. And that's where the author says that whenever the transition is happening from the old dominant power to the new dominant power, those 15, 20 years is where you have a lot of geopolitical unrest and conflict. And, you know, we are sort of yeah, in that stage. So I don't know yeah, whether Russia, Ukraine, the Israel, Palestine conflict, they are part of this. But at least that's what the history is saying, that whenever the transition happens, the new dominant power is trying to exert their influence and the old dominant power is trying to protect their influence. So you will always see conflict uh, in, in that context. But one of the big change which is happening is that we're not just going to have one power. So we have, we've been in a unipolar world where always one country dominated, but we are slowly switching to a multipolar world where there may be four or five countries which dominate and they have the influence. So it just won't be one country. And that also then creates various implications from a geopolitical uh, perspective. But this is a very good book. Yeah, if, you're, if you are interested in geopolitical risk and want to understand the big picture of what is going on. So because if you just look at the news, then it's very easy to get lost in the details. And then you don't understand that, okay, what is actually happening behind the scene? And this book definitely has a lot of facts and analysis of how why these things are uh, happening. And then we also see uh, there, there was this statistics where yeah, uh, when we look at these geopolitical uh, wars which are happening, you know, it, it may sort of yeah, feel like, oh, there is a lot happening. But when you look at the history, we are sort of yeah, living at our most peaceful time in terms of the number of deaths uh, which are happening around the world. But because we have this trend around citizen journalism, the information is getting uh, disseminated very quickly on social media. We have 6.84 billion phones which are taking video, sharing that with the world. There is clickbait journalism where you know, people want you know, headlines which are uh, inviting people to uh, click on those headlines. And then of course the traditional media has their own biases. So they're not sort of yeah, communicating the true picture. They're communicating whatever their biases are uh, or their sponsors uh, biases are. So we don't really get the true picture of you know, what is happening. It may feel like you know, a war is happening somewhere and then you just, if you're following the news, it may feel like yeah, the war is happening in your country or on your street. But sort of when you take a step back, you know, we are living at one of our most peaceful times globally. You know, of course, that, you know, doesn't mean a lot for people in Ukraine or Russia and Israel and Palestine who are directly affected by those conflicts. But at least from a sort of global uh, risk management perspective, uh, we, we get that view, you know, from uh, the data which is shared in this particular uh, book. So, so in the geopolitical, yeah, the big black swan or the big unknown is the nuclear weapon. So this is where if yeah, there was a nuclear weapon was used in any of this conflict, then things can change very quickly uh, from, a, from a risk management perspective. Uh, so we hope that yeah, our leaders are responsible and they, they don't take us to, to that stage where one party or one country has to use a nuclear weapon in, in one of these conflicts. Uh, but one of the sort of positive, if you look at the, the Ray Dalio book, is uh, the U.S. and major European countries, they're running out of money because they've spent so much money in COVID and inflation and so on that uh, they don't have enough money to keep sponsoring this war. So hopefully that will you know, start bringing some sense and it'll, it'll create question marks on whether they should continue to sponsor those these conflicts. Uh, and whether they should get involved with new conflicts which get created because they're just running out of financial resources. And, and that sort of is where we expect there will be probably pressure on Ukraine to settle uh, the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, in the near term because US government just doesn't have the money to keep sponsoring that uh, 
war anymore uh, or sponsoring Ukraine anymore. And the Republican presidents are completely against that. So if we have a Republican president win in November, then there'll definitely be pressure on Ukraine to settle with Russia and end that conflict later this year or maybe early next year. So that's just not my view. That's just a view, one view or one scenario, which is out there being shared by experts. From a Middle East perspective, we also have yeah, organization, uh, countries like UAE, Saudi Arabia, Qatar. They are preparing the nations for a post-oil era. So you've seen like the NEOM project, the various projects in UAE, where they want their countries to become cultural, tourism, and sporting attractions over the next 10 to 20 years. So these uh, Middle East uh, powerful countries, they are going to then exert their influence in Middle East and make sure that the conflicts in Middle East don't emerge or they don't become very big scale, uh, that they are going to play a leading role to make sure that the yeah, Middle East doesn't have the reputation of you know, not being a great place for tourism and sporting attractions. So there is that sort of yeah, underlying wave which should hopefully reduce the amount of conflicts uh, we see in that region. Another big unknown at the moment is yeah, China. So, so that sort of is what uh, the geopolitical experts are you know, keeping their fingers crossed on that China doesn't go and invade Taiwan because if that happens, then yeah, that can start another round of consequences around geopolitical risk. Uh, so, so we hope that yeah, that doesn't happen uh, anytime soon. From an operational risk perspective, we also seeing that yeah, these wars are not just happening on the ground, but they're also happening in the cyberspace. So, so like UK is involved in the Russia uh, uh, Ukraine conflict. So there were various gangs which were then also targeting UK organizations or US organizations. So, so we also have seen increased amount of cyber attacks which are then associated with these uh, geopolitical conflict. And something we saw in the Ukraine conflict is there was also a rise in hacktivist groups. So there were like 10,000, 15,000, just civilians who were cyber experts. They just anonymously got together and started helping Ukraine to launch cyber attack against Russia. And, and that was never seen in the past at such a big scale, but we did see that. So it's possible that yeah, in future geopolitical conflict that happens uh, a, a lot more. And from an organization perspective, so all of this then come boils down to operational resilience. So that's where we need to be aware of. So an individual financial services organization cannot do that much in terms of ending these conflict or influencing the direction of this conflict. But yeah, we need to keep an eye and then ensure that yeah, we don't have resilience related challenges in our organization, which could get affected by the current conflicts or by new conflicts, uh, which get started. Okay, so with that, let me pause at this stage. I will just invite Jackie. I'm now sharing my screen. Excellent. Yes. Thank you for that presentation. That was really useful. Um, and I see cyber is very high up the top 10 um, uh, operational risks that we're seeing in some of the, the presentations that are coming out from different organizations. So very aligned with that. So um, this is me. I work for a Norwegian bank called DNB. It's the largest bank in Norway. Um, my association with Risk Spotlight is as a user uh, of many years, both in this bank and my previous bank as well. So my involvement is professional, not commercial. Um, so this is exactly how I use uh, Risk Spotlight. I'm the head of operational risk in the London office, and I've also worked in the group team in, in Oslo in Norway. So my use of Risk Spotlight has therefore been for the purposes of the local team and for the needs of a group function. So, it, you, you know, you can use it in both sort of areas and needs. So I'll tell you what I use um, the information for, but I will caveat this by saying that we could be using it more and I'm well aware that it offers more than we're using it. And I'm going to rely on Risk Spotlight being there as we go along that kind of improvement embedding of operational risk management journey, because it's a continuous process. So I'll start by saying I find the portal, which you'll see here, um, this is my landing page. I find it very easy to use. 
Um, if I ever have any questions from on it, uh, the, the team, uh, Risk Spotlight team, are very super quick to respond. Um, there is news articles here on the left and quick links to the right. And then to be able to um, jump to the analysis, there's these tabs at the um, at the top here, which covers the analysis and the radar, which I'll come to in a second. So one of the functions of the international offices for the bank I work for is as a listening post. Um, and it's to feed back to the group what we see, what we hear from our networks, etc. And these, the, this is one of the tools that I use. And so for this purpose, risk spotlight deep dives are excellent because most of my work is done already. Um, and once you log in, you'll be able to see, you know, you can just choose them from here. Um, either the deep dives or the actual publications, both are fantastic sources of information. Um, so this is what the first page of this particular deep dive looks like. Um, so what do I do with this information? I'm not going to go all the way through it, but as you know, the devil's in the detail. So there's no point in sending this report just directly out to the business, but I use it to, um, here in the London office, to have conversations with the business heads, to start those conversations um, about, in this particular case, employee well-being and mental health, for example. Um, I use them for background information for risk and control self-assessments. It's particularly good uh, background reading uh, prior to a workshop. Um, and I will also post these internally to the group's second line team, um, which as you'll see, this is the type of um, posting that I, that I will put up. And I'll also email them to key people in the business to start discussion. So the one on employee well-being, I will then post to somebody in HR and have those conversations uh, with them. Um, I sometimes also will post them in a wider uh, discussion group and offer the report as reading and use that as an in to that particular group for training and awareness sessions. It's all about being an operational risk manager is sometimes about the relationship um, as much about what you're saying. So the deep dive reports, they're not really lengthy. They're quite short, and but they contain a lot. So there's generally some background information, some key terminology, uh, details of recent loss events, examples of risks that are associated with that subject, statistical data. I mean, you know, I can't tell you how good this stuff is. There's a lot in a very short um, amount of space. Um, the report, in some instances, touches on regulatory updates and emerging trends. And the best part for me is that some of the reports talk about best practices in the industry. Um, so it means that I don't have to read multiple reports to find out one answer. I can just read these. Um, for me, it's worth a subscription just for the deep dives, to be quite honest, which Manoj, you didn't hear that because you'll probably put my uh, subscription up. Um, and then on the publications, there are so many publications that come into my inbox nowadays on operational risk management, non-financial risk, which is great. I'm glad to see it's going up. But it can become overwhelming. And for me, Risk Spotlight identifies the important stuff and puts it into a filterable, if that's a word, uh, format with links to that publication. And it also spits, splits the publication into um, emerging topics and loss events as well. I, I use this more for my personal learning and keeping up to date with what's happening. Um, and if it's appropriate to our remit um, of a listening post, for example, that's, that's one of the things that we call ourselves a listening post. I may send the publication to a colleague or to a particular team to discuss further or to ask questions um, that are relevant to my organisation. And then um, the operational risk radar is another element of, of risk spotlight. Um, and I use this for sourcing information on specific risk topic, topics, sorry. Or if I want a quick review of recent topics, and my example that I've ringed there was um, on the subject of cyber criminals using AI, um, very relevant for, for today's starting topic. And by clicking on that topic title, um, 
it can link then to what we'll take to a number of articles which you can then filter depending on your need. So, for example, you know, there's 253 articles on cyber criminals using AI. I don't want to read all 253, but I can click on those and then filter them. So it it really is, a, you know, a useful, a useful tool. So, so these are the topics. I think I just showed you what it actually looks like. So this was the 253 articles. When you click into it, it comes to these and you can then have a scan down and see what you're actually looking for. So that was my very quick run through of how I use um, Risk Spotlight. As I say, it does a lot more than we're using it for, but these are the, the main things that I use uh, Risk Spotlight for and will continue to do so. I'm, I'm hopeful of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. And then I can just yeah quickly show what that looks like. Yeah, so you also see that uh, in the live mm -hmm. mode, uh, uh, and then you can see some of the latest topic. So this is the view of yeah, Risk Spotlight portal. So everything, all the content you've seen today, all that is coming yeah, from the information we are collecting every day on operational risks from around the world. Uh, so Operisk Radar is the one uh, which uh, Jackie was talking about, that this is where we identify the key themes or the topics which are in news at the moment. Uh, and then whichever topic is more in the news, then they will automatically come in the top of the list. Whichever topics are not that much in the news, they automatically go down in the list. So if you want to find out that, okay, what five operational risk topics are most in the news, you can always come to the screen and you can see, okay, what those five topics are. So, so we, uh, Jackie was yeah, talking about the cyber criminals utilizing AI. So you can see that there are 255 articles related to that. So you can click on that 255 and you can then see how cyber criminals are using AI to launch cyber attacks. So you can then learn from those and understand uh, those topics. Similarly, we have, if you want yeah, emerging regulations on artificial intelligence, so we've got that as a topic. So you can click on 409 and then you can see how the different regulators are thinking about AI regulation at the moment and what your organization may need to uh, be ready with. Uh, similarly, we have the emerging risks yeah, of using generative AI, the chat GPT type technology we talked about earlier. So you also got articles here, which then go into detail of yeah, what those risks are. But these articles also talk about the controls and the mitigation step and what policies your organization need to have in place. So this is a great tool for the second line team yeah, who want to monitor, who want to be the eyes and ears for uh, your organization. So at least you you know, get this information. And like Jackie said, Jackie said, then your second line team can then decide how you cascade that information. And we've had a couple of organizations which have given like 250 people in first line, second line, third line access to this because they wanted everybody in the organization to be able to monitor rather than second line team, you know, becoming the uh, the bridge. They wanted all the risk owners in the first line, you know, to monitor their respective risks uh, and incorporate that into their risk assessments, their control assessments, incorporate that information. So that's what the radar gives you. So any topic we've talked about, if you want to then deep dive into those, then there is a lot of detailed content and we are updating this every day. So we have a dedicated team, which is looking at these sort of news articles around operational risk in financial services. So every day, new content is getting added. And this is where you'll be able to get the deep dive. So because yeah, we have so many operational risk categories, we don't have time to cover all of those. So you will get the slides uh, I have prepared, but we also created a detailed deep dive in January where we went and analyzed if I just quickly open that deep dive, then that sort of is where I recommend that if you are interested in emerging risk, definitely go through this deep dive where we take the risk category, so the external theft and fraud, and then we break that down into cyber and non-cyber. And then we, based on our research, we list yeah, all the different topics which you need to have on your radar for 2024. So these are non-cyber related. Then we have business process execution failure, technology failure, internal theft and fraud. So we look at all the category items. We do a lot of detailed research to find out what are the big topics which are going to be in the media, uh, will be on the risk radar for 2024. And we share this with our subscriber at the start of the year. 
uh, so, so that is a very useful resource. Uh, and in December, we also did a deep dive on all the big loss events that happened in 2023. So if you want to understand, so I can also quickly open that particular deep dive where it will analyze. So in this case, yeah, there was the Move It uh, cyber attack. There's the American Family Insurance, DPS Bank, Citibank outage. So we went and analyzed yeah, all the big events that have happened in 2023. And then we break these down from an event perspective where we then try to present a timeline of what actually happened. And then we try to analyze and present the financial and the non-financial impacts of that particular event. So you can then learn from uh, these events which are happening in other organizations. So this is also a significant uh, resource which can be very useful uh, for your risk owners. And then every month we share the topics with our subscribers. They prioritize those topics and then we pick those topics, analyze them. So in October, we analyzed yeah, the deep fake technology where we drilled down just in that one big risk topic, which is going to be in the news in 2024. Jackie talked about the well-being of mental health, which was another one. So each month you will get a new deep dive. And the focus is, you know, not to give you like 200 page of report because that is uh, that is useless, right? That somebody gives you a 200 page report. So this is meant for senior executives who don't have time to read 100, 200 articles to try and understand that we then read the 100, 200 articles. And then we try to shrink all of that into four or five pages. And we do everything from an operational risk perspective. So we don't just talk about AI generally. We talk about AI from an operational risk perspective. We don't talk about climate risk. Generally, we talk about climate risk from an operational risk perspective. So, so, that's, so our senior executives don't have to go and read 100 articles to try and understand a particular topic. So this is also a great resource. And from what we know, there is no other provider in the industry which provides this forward-looking type content. So we have ORX, we have BBA Gold, which provide a lot of content on loss events which is all history, but there is nobody providing this forward-looking content. Uh, and, and that sort of is where at Risk Spotlight, yeah, we want to be the leaders uh, in that space where we are sort of looking forward and giving you that content, which can be useful for RCSA, monitoring your emerging risks uh, and uh, helping you also identify the best practices which are emerging uh, within the different sectors. So I see from the list of names that yeah, many uh, subscribers are already on the call. So you all have access to all this deep dive, but for uh, organizations and participants who are not on the subscriber list, it is very easy to get access. So we offer a, a two months free trial where you will, you'll be able to log in, try all the content and then decide whether yeah, this is something which can be useful uh, for your team to get a subscription off, but at least you can try and there is no credit card detail required. Uh, to do that subscription. So I strongly recommend that at least for the deep dive in January and the loss event deep dive we did in December, that at least those are two very valuable resources. And of course, then if you continue to subscribe, you'll keep getting uh, more updates and we keep you informed on the topics you should have on your radar. Uh, so you can then focus on managing your risks internally. You don't need to keep an eye on what ha what's happening outside. We can do that filtering and give that information to you. So, so from a timing perspective, so maybe that's where I wanted to, I want to stop. So I had a few slides where I just went into different categories of I've taken improper business practices. And then we've just highlighted the different topics I wanted to bring across, but we don't have the time, but you are all going to get the slides. So you will be able to yeah, still get access to the content. So that's what the next few slides were that they were just, we were going through the individual risk category and just highlighting which topics which are also then yeah, covered in that deep dive document into the portal. But because of yeah, the shortage of time, I won't go through all of these slides. You will get the slides. And if you want to discuss any of those topics in a little bit more detail, then happy to have a detailed Zoom conversation with your team. If you say that, okay, we want to explore this aspect in a little bit more detail, then we can definitely help uh, with that aspect. I've already yeah, talked about the trial of the portal. Uh, and then before I take questions, I just want to also yeah, talk about the AI practice because we see that generative AI is going to be transformative generally for the business. Uh, and at the same time, also for the operational risk management that the amount of use cases where 
generative AI can be used to improve the productivity and quality of operational risk management is significant. And that's where, as an organization, we want to then help our uh, uh, help our customers in financial services organization to uh, uh, facilitate and use this technology to maximize the advantage and minimize the risk. So, so we've analyzed the risk and uh, we have guidance and best practices we can provide on how you can mitigate those risks. So that sort of is where we have the AI practice, which is where we can come and help run training sessions because this is so new. We, we're getting requests request from organization to come and uh, do a 90 minute session for their second line team or for their senior management team so that they understand the big picture of why they need to pay attention. So we can run those sort of sessions. We are running pilot use cases for some organizations. We're helping organizations to pick what are the right tools because there are 10, uh, 10 to 12 tools which are available. Chat GPT is just one of them. We're helping define the business cases. We're helping organization define their overall strategy of how they should look at generative AI over a three to five year time period. And we're also helping some organization build AI applications where if they already have the risk data, control data in the GRC system, then how can they integrate generative AI? So to take advantage of uh, the information they already have, or to also improve the quality of controls they have in their GRC system. They'll be also helping organizations with that. So if any of this was of interest for your team, then happy to uh, have a little bit more detailed conversation uh, around that. And I just want to then highlight before I take uh, questions. So just yeah, this uh, forum I talked about, where if you're interested more in the generative AI risk, then from the Risk Spotlight website, you can just go to the training page and we have the Generative AI Operational Risk Forum. So you can go here and register if you are interested. And it's only open for individuals who work in a financial services organization and who are responsible for identifying, analyzing these generative AI risks. So whoever participates, yeah, they'll need to come and talk, right? So it won't be a session like today where I do all the talking, it'll be an interaction. So only yeah, come and register for this session if you want to yeah, listen and learn from the other practitioners, but it'll also be expected that you are also sharing your experiences. So everybody then gets the benefit and it's not just your yeah, two people talking and then 50 people are just listening, then it won't be very productive. So only then, yeah, if you're interested in contributing and learning from the other practitioners, then please register and we'll send you the logistical details uh, of that particular session. So with that, then I will pause and I will then just answer any questions uh, which you share. So I'll, I'll keep an eye now on the chat where you can share your questions. Okay, so I've already uh, answered about the slides. There were a few questions about the slides. Okay, so there's one comment around here. One of the challenges faced for solution implementing is acceptability, fear of connecting integration of the solution with Gen AI solutions highlighted by InfoSec department is a major obstacle. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, because it's new. So there is yeah that element of newness, but the risks of using generative AI are very similar to the risks of you using internet. So, you know, if we are comfortable providing mobile banking app, on online banking app, that those apps are probably exposed to a lot more risks than the risks of using generative AI. So, of course, yeah, there is, because it's new, there is a element of hesitancy. But if you actually have a detailed conversation around the controls which can be implemented, the risks are very mitigatable. So there is nothing shocking we have found which will completely stop an organization. And you've already seen from that screenshot that various organizations have already started using it to take that lead in terms of innovation, where they're thinking of new products and services they can offer using AI. Then I had uh, one comment around, yeah, how will uh, cyber criminals know uh, that an organization has not reported a cyber incident to the regulator. Well, they don't need to, right? They can still go and just send an email to the regulator. They don't need to know whether an organization is reported or not reported. The cyber criminal can still go to whatever hotline the regulator has provided and share that. And if the, if the organization is already reported, the regulator can ignore that. If the organization is not reported, then the regulator will start 
uh, calling the people in the organization to figure out. So I don't think that, that uh, necessarily is changes anything, whether cyber criminals know or don't know. Oh, so there was a yeah, question on the deep dive. So yeah, for the deep dive, if you want access, yeah, I, I gave you the link. So on the risk spotlight, uh, if you go to the risk spotlight website uh, from this homepage, uh, you can register. If you're not a subscriber, you can just register and then you'll be able to access the deep dives, uh, not only of the emerging risk, but all the other deep dives and also the other content. So, so that's the quickest way to get access. Yeah, so there's one comment about it. Said, yeah, very exciting times ahead for operational risk practitioners. So yeah, completely agree uh, with that side that, yeah, it is the amount of changes we are going through. If you look at climate risk and AI and operational resilience, uh, this is definitely an exciting time for uh, good operational risk practitioners, you know, who really are passionate about helping their organizations. Uh, it, it's going to be stressful. <laughs> There's going to be a many stressful days, but it's definitely ex exciting times that we can demonstrate our value. There's so many op opportunities to demonstrate uh, how operational risk practitioners can create value and protect value for the organization. Okay, there was one question around, do you think the remote working related risks uh, can be an emerging risk? Uh, so we we don't see that at the moment yet. So it should be on the radar because a lot of organizations are still doing the transition. But at least in sort of Europe, we've seen that yeah, most organizations now have stabilized that they've agreed that, okay, two days you have to be in office and the rest of the time you can be remote working. The technology risks are also very well settled. Uh, so in the early days of COVID, yeah, that was a big concern, but uh, at least it's all become manageable. So there is nothing we saw which was changing significantly that most organizations have a pretty good handle on how they're managing the technology and the business process failure risks. Uh, but something I did have in my employment practices was the mental uh, the mental well-being. So that is one of the concerns we are seeing, that because everybody's remote working, they may not feel part of the team. Uh, so there, there is definitely concerns around the men mental uh, well-being and health of employees. So that's something organizations will definitely need to keep an eye on, but at least the cyber risk, the business process related risks are pretty much under control in most organization based on what we've seen. If you don't have any questions, then thank you very much for attending the session. Hope you found it useful. You'll get yeah, the slides and recordings within 48 hours and I look forward to continuing the collaboration.